live in The Hague, we live across the street from uh, two very, very busy bars. March 14th, which was a Saturday night, everybody was out there partying. It was just packed, 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 packed. My partner and I looked outside and we were like, this, this, is, this is insane. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. And so when they shut down the bars, I remember breathing a sigh of relief because I thought, well, at least, at least something is being done. Five days later, I remember thinking, there's still frightening levels of inaction. And then finally, the tide started to turn and, and most, if not all, countries in Europe started to take aggressive action. A lot of the freelancers that I know either didn't have any students or their students didn't want to make the transition into virtual lessons or they didn't have enough students. You go from earning money, doing A and B, and suddenly B is no longer happening. You have less money. What I really miss actually is rehearsing. I really miss rehearsing. Not only is rehearsing, you know, an exchange of musical ideas, it's also like a, it's a social ritual. I think that it's healthy actually for musicians to take a step back and really evaluate what part of this lifestyle is absolutely critical and fundamental to the process of bringing people music. For me, it was healthy to be able to just sort of reconnect with the instrument, to practice whatever I wanted to practice. I do have to say that in terms of evaluating my role as a musician in society, whereas before social issues were something that I was interested in, but they were generally sort of separate from my day-to-day -day activities, I never really had the sense that I need to lend my voice. The pandemic has forced me to consider what my role in society is and forced me to think hard about my role not only as a professional and an entrepreneur, but also as a citizen. To think about how I can balance my desire to be a prominent and thriving musician with my desire to, to help, to participate in society in a meaningful way. I think that what's been so moving about young people in the past months and the past years is the way that they've taken on issues of racism and climate change as, as their issues. What hasn't happened yet is for people of our generation to consider the pandemic in the same way as something that we need to all be engaged in. It's not going to go away unless we all participate. I do think that maybe the pandemic is forcing us to reevaluate long-term care. For decades, we've accepted it as a given that when people get old enough, they just move into a home. Their life expectancy, once they reach a long-term care home, it's, it's only three years. Is this really a humane way to treat, you know, the oldest and wisest members of our society? For me, what was the most heartbreaking in the Netherlands was that outbreaks in long-term care homes were and still are almost completely unreported. We know that almost half of people who died of COVID-19 were never tested. If they never got tested, it means they probably never made it to a hospital. Testing was nearly inaccessible to people in nursing homes. For me, it's not just about the suffering, it's about the degree to which that suffering was invisible. That makes me very, very angry. Ageism was not really an issue that I had thought a lot about prior to this pandemic. But I think that this pandemic has exposed a lot of the weak spots in society. And one of the weak spots is how we treat our elderly and our attitudes toward the elderly. There was a man who went on Dutch television early in the pandemic and he said, why are we doing all this just to save people that are over 80 and smoke too much? And that's a horrifying idea. I think that the reason that Europe failed to prepare adequately in the nearly two months that they had to prepare is that they assumed that Asia was different. We're a wealthier, more advanced society. Nothing like that could ever happen to us. The myth of European exceptionalism is probably what drove a lot of the inaction. And it wasn't until we saw serious outbreaks in Italy that European nations started to consider, oh, wow, this could actually happen here. 
It's hard to feel optimistic right now because things are still so precarious. In large parts of the world, transmission is largely under control, but as we've seen, uptakes can happen anywhere at any time. The only thing preventing that from happening is vigilance, testing, contact tracing, isolating, quarantine, mask wearing, hand hygiene. I'm hoping that it will force us to re-examine the way that we evaluate other crises, the most obvious ones being climate change. There's a lot of good that can come out of this, and there's lots of good that has come out of this. The sacrifices that have been made by healthcare workers, the sacrifices that have been made by everyday individuals, people staying home. It's an act of compassion, and lots and lots of people did that, and it's because they cared about each other. That's deeply moving. The resources that go into protecting against something like terrorism are almost unthinkable. So much money and so much civil liberty actually is expended. And terrorism, at least in most Western nations, kills a, the tiniest fraction of the number of people that can be killed by a global pandemic or by climate change. The pandemic won't go from existing to not existing. There is no return to 2019. That life will never happen. A lot of countries, including the Netherlands, are cutting the five-year source of funds for major cultural institutions. The truth is that once you do that, you're not coming back. Going forward, I imagine that musicians will find a way to adapt. It will happen. There will be trailblazers. We should keep hope. We should stay hopeful. This is temporary. It is temporary. Life will not always be like this.